Thanks for being here. Thanks for showing up for Climate Solutions, taking time out of your, your days to really lean in and think about capitalism and climate change and how we can move toward solutions. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Jamie Beck Alexander. I've had the pleasure of knowing Jamie since 2020 and have learned so much and continue to learn so much from her. Jamie is a climate activist, she is a mom, and she is the founding director of Drawdown Labs, um, Project Drawdown's private sector testing ground for accelerating and scaling climate solutions quickly, safely, and equitably. Jamie developed and launched Drawdown Labs in 2020 and has led the program to really push the boundaries of private sector climate action. Her popular TEDx talk, which will drop in the chat, uh, has helped usher in a new wave of employee climate activism inside the world's most influential companies. So without further ado, welcome, Jamie. We are so glad you're here. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, it's so great to be here with all of you today. And thank you for joining us for what I truly think is one of the most, if not the most important topic that we as a climate community align on. And that topic is how we deal with capitalism. Personally, um, this is a topic that keeps me up at night. Um, it's kept me up at night since I first started learning about climate change and its root causes. Um, and that concern has only intensified and gotten more and more sort of visceral as I work more and more deeply within the capitalist system. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to sort of give this topic the light of day and to explore openly together how we can grapple together with this tension and hopefully come out of it with some shared goals. Um, but before we start, I want to ground our session today in some words from one of my favorite poets, um, the incredible Ada Limon. Out here, there's a bowing even the trees are doing. Winter's icy hand at the back of all of us. Black bark, slick yellow leaves, a kind of stillness that feels so mute. It's almost in another year. I am a hearth of spiders these days, a nest of trying. We point out the stars that make Orion as we take out the trash. The rolling containers, a song of suburban thunder. It's almost romantic as we adjust the waxy blue recycling bin until you say, man, we should really learn some new constellations. <laughs> and it's true. We keep forgetting about Antlia, Centaurus, Draco, Lacerta, Hydra, Lyra, Lynx. But mostly we're forgetting we're dead stars too. My mouth is full of dust and I wish to reclaim the rising, to lean in the spotlight of streetlight with you, toward what's larger within us, toward how we were born. Look, we are not unspectacular things. We've come this far, survived this much. What would happen if we decided to survive more, to love harder? What if we stood up with our synapses in flesh and said, no, no to the rising tides? stood for the many mute mouths of the sea, of the land? What would happen if we used our bodies to bargain for the safety of others, for earth? If we declared a clean night, if we stopped being terrified, if we launched our demands into the sky, made ourselves so big, people could point to it, us with the arrows they make in their minds, rolling their trash bins out after all of this is over. And that was Ada Limon, U.S. Poet Laureate, with her poem, Dead Stars. Um, and I played that to ground our session because part of what I think we need to do as human beings alive today is to think bigger than ourselves, bigger than the structures that we human beings have created, bigger even than the great granddaddy structure of them all, capitalism. Um, so thank you for joining me here on this journey today. To start, um, so who am I to talk about this topic? Um, and this is not me. This is not me on the screen, by the way. Um, I am not an economist. I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not a business person. Um, but I am a bridge builder and a dot connector. And I work with one foot in the world of climate change and one foot in the world of business and finance. And I want to tell a quick story about what led me to question 
um, this question that we're here to explore together today. Um, so take a look at this picture. It's from your typical corporate sustainability conference. Um, now, I'm not trying to dunk on this particular person. I don't even know who this, this person is um, or this conference, but it did provide an important backdrop for me, um, an important uh, for an important learning that has kind of I've carried with me in my work. Um, so I was in the audience, you know, trying to get into climate work, trying to break into the field, um, and was listening in on this closing plenary session. I was so excited to hear about what the closing keynote would share about their company's groundbreaking climate goals. And to the stage walks the head of sustainability for um, sort of a, a big box general merchandise retailer company, basically the kind of company that sells a bunch of stuff that pretty much everyone loves, but no one actually really needs. Um, and the sustainability executive walks on the stage to great fanfare to present the company's, you know, world-changing sustainability initiative. Uh, and, and that idea was basically you know, that what they announced on stage was basically this new line of new eco-friendly products that was encased in eco-friendly plastic using all the latest eco-friendly technology with climate-friendly messaging, et cetera, et cetera. And the crowd was clapping and back patting. And it was like this guy had just you know, proven the existence of aliens or something. It was like this big revolutionary climate announcement. And I'm just sitting there thinking, you know, isn't that company still just producing massive amounts of stuff in the world that isn't really needed, but that just serves to, you know, to, it just serves to really feed our perceived need for more and more. Um, and isn't this all like, what, what is this actually helping? What am I not understanding here? And I think many of us are here today because we feel that tension every day, whether we're an activist or a chief sustainability officer or an impact investor or a climate concerned citizen and consumer, we feel that tension. And that experience in that plenary session has stuck with me ever since. Now I'm the director of a program at Project Drawdown called Drawdown Labs, where I actually work closely with businesses, climate funders, investors, deeply within the system. Some might say inside the belly of the beast um, to support and accelerate the work of the private sector. So I swim in this question and these tensions every day. Is capitalism compatible with thriving life on our planet? How do we square an incessant need for profit and growth with the limitations that the planet and human well being are very clearly showing us? So, although I might not be an economist, I'm grateful to share some of my insights and learnings with you in the, the meshing and the, the messy middle you know, of these two worlds that I operate in, and hopefully to hear your insights um, for things that we can do to accelerate our shared work. So why are we here? Number one, um, to just really first and foremost, confront the elephant in the room um, between capitalism and climate change outright. Instead of kind of retreating to our factions, you know, um, more eco-socialists over here and climate concerned capitalists over here, digging in our heels against one another, our purpose today is to give this conversation the light of day so we can understand where are we aligned? Where do we have work to do? What can we all get started on together today? And ideally, see ourselves as part of the same team. Second, um, identify how we might use or leverage, um, you know, or maybe even exploit, you could say, some of the features of capitalism to help scale equitable climate solutions. So even if you hate capitalism, there are some pretty powerful elements to it that we need in order to do what needs to be done in the vanishing window of time we have in front of us. Third, um, we need to face the difficult truth together that for some sectors, some business models, some things will need to be phased out, will need to be transitioned full stop. We need to face that truth, not hide it in the shadows or not you know, have it be something that's implied but not said. We need to be forthcoming about that. Um, we need to phase out some sectors, some business models, period. And last, we need to understand the power that each of us has in different facets of our lives as employees, individual consumers, activists, community members, et cetera, the power that each of us have to accelerate the good parts of capitalism. And then you also use our power and leverage to sort of slow down the bad parts of capitalism that are not support that are not serving us. So let's get started by anchoring ourselves in the most critical of climate foundations, and that is the anchor of time. Um, and I really want to anchor the entire webinar today in time because time is the most important variable. Um, there was a chilling line to me in a, in a climate report from a few years ago um, that said, every ton of CO2 emissions adds to global warming. So every single thing that we're doing is 
sending more and more stuff into the atmosphere that is contributing to what we're seeing play out all around us. And time has been quietly slipping by since then, as every second we continue to churn more and more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Every day matters. This, in this red circle is where we are right now. This red line shows the greenhouse gas emissions that are churning into our atmosphere every minute, going up and up. And today we're at that red circle, an inflection point, a turning point where we must dramatically reduce the emissions that we humans are pouring into the atmosphere every day. This is what we mean by the emissions curve. So this circled area is perhaps the most important area of the whole graph. This is where we make the dramatic pivot from now until 2030, we must cut our emissions in half. We have six and a half years to do incredibly difficult but transformational things. So yes, capitalism has caused this problem, but I would argue that we probably can't complete a socialist revolution and then solve climate change all in the next six and a half years. Because what we do in 100 years doesn't really matter if we don't do what needs to be done in the next seven. So we need to really hold what I think are two contradictory truths at the same time. One, on one hand, that we need to move as fast as humanly possible to cut emissions this decade. And therefore, we may need to operate within the system that we have now, on one hand. And on the other hand, that climate change or capitalism is what got us into this mess in the first place, and we can't grow our way out of it. So how do we hold those two truths at the same time? Well, one way that I am working on squaring that circle is by trying to be a really good operator within the capitalist system. So how can we do what needs to be done in this immediate next six and a half years? How can we use the system, leverage some of the elements of capitalism to do what we need to do this decade? Um, and I have a hunch that in doing some of those things over the next six and a half years, it may actually help us transition to a more just and moral economic model that we will touch on that later. But today, primarily, we're going to focus on how we treat the next seven years, six and a half years. So we have anchored our conversation now today in the critical importance of time. Now let's focus in on how we can leverage capitalism to achieve our climate goals in the next six and a half years, while we lay the groundwork, again, for a more moral and just and inclusive system in the longer term. So what are the specific features of capitalism that we can leverage to bend that emissions curve in the 2020s? Well, number one, the very concept and engine of growth. So the most sacred of economic concepts right out of the capitalism playbook is growth, right? We can use capitalism to grow climate solutions. The concept of profit, endless growth is, you know, that is, yes, what got us into this crisis. But growth isn't all bad. In fact, there are a lot of things that need to grow. But what should grow and what shouldn't grow is a question that I don't think we ask enough. So just equitable science-based climate solutions are what should grow. I think most of us would agree on that. And you know, we're Project Drawdown. What you know and love us for is our expertise on scientifically viable climate solutions. That's what should grow. Many of these solutions that you see on your screen here desperately need an infusion of capital. Government can help inspire that and set lay the, the regulatory environment for that, but business and investment is needed to build it. Not all of these solutions require capitalism, though. Some will be mixed, capitalism for some things, but then lots of public sector support focused on policymaking to help it all happen faster. These are solutions across the electricity sector, food and agriculture sector, transportation, buildings, heavy industry, and more. But, and this is a big but, um, we're not talking about growth for growth's sake, let me be clear. We're talking about growth in hyper strategic areas, laser focused on climate solutions and laser focused on systematically replacing business as usual. And I think that this is the thing that we do not talk about enough in the climate solution space. Growth of climate solutions is not just another excuse for more capitalism. It's not just more for the sake of more. What this inherently means is that is not that climate solutions are additive, right? We're not adding another aisle of eco-friendly products to the big box retailer. We are replacing completely and comprehensively our current way of doing things that are incompatible with thriving life on our planet. 
um, to hearken, um, Danella Meadows, the incredible um, systems thinker, um, had a, an amazing quote. If you want people to go out the front door, you have to close the back door. So in this context, if we want to make a dramatic pivot to climate solutions, we don't just we don't also leave the door open to fossil fuels and other high emitting sectors. We have to at the same time open up the door to climate solutions and close off what is not any longer working. Let's look, for example, at transportation solutions. So transportation is the biggest emitting sector in the United States. We list carpooling here as a climate solution. But we now know from recent research that the huge rise of ride sharing companies didn't actually do anything to reduce our overall emissions. They actually contributed to an overall increase in transportation emissions or telepresence we have listed as a climate solution. The fact that virtual meetings have become the norm hasn't actually done a lot to reduce air travel. Air travel is right back to where it was before the pandemic. So we're not talking about scaling for the sake of growth. We're talking about replacing trips that we would have otherwise taken in an airplane, replacing trips with carpooling or biking that we would have otherwise taken in a car. Um, so our solution cannot be to grow our way out of this problem. We can't just replace every internal combustion engine car with an electric car. We also need high-speed rail, bike lanes, better designed cities. So we need capitalism, capitalism building electric vehicles and a public sector that is focused on policy and land use and bike lanes and public transit. We need all of those things. So what our wheel of climate solutions again here shows is what the climate solutions are, but what it doesn't show you is what needs to stop. Um, so we need growth, but we also need to stop other things, grow the things that need to grow and stop the things that aren't in this wheel. And for some entire companies and industries, and this is a very difficult truth, I think, for some entire companies and industries, that means lights off, right? That means either transition and pivot or you're incompatible with where we need to head. And so let's catch those industries and workers. Those workers can move into other job programs, transitioned into jobs on that wheel of climate solutions. So that was a sort of quick exploration of how grow, the very concept of growth can be used to help scale some things and phase out other things. Another aspect of capitalism that we can use to achieve our climate goals, um, well, we can use capitalism to divert massive amounts of capital. Um, in our current economic system, we know that money holds a lot of power. So much of that money is still being funneled toward fossil fuels and other extractive industries. Big businesses can influence their banks to stop financing fossil fuels, cutting off the blood flow to high emitting sectors. Businesses can provide green 401k options for their employees instead of retirement plans that are invested in high emitting sectors. This is how we begin to cut off the blood flow to heavy emitting sectors, and we can use the current system to help do that. On the other side, we also need to deploy capital wisely to climate solutions. We don't have time for a scattershot approach. So what you see here um, is, is recent work from, from our drawdown team where you can see where emissions across the top um, are coming from. This is These are the biggest emitting sectors. This is where our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. And we would expect to generally see a matchup of where money is going according to where the biggest problems are. But what you see here is where philanthropy is going, um, where venture capital is going. And you can see there's there's pretty pretty extreme misalignment here with a ton of venture capital going to transportation, mostly electric vehicle solutions. Um, and then here you can see where Inflation Reduction Act spending is going, and that's, again, mostly to electricity. So we can use science to actually align our, our capital better, align funding with our planetary portfolio. Um, so we're not just throwing spaghetti at the wall and putting all of our eggs in, for example, the carbon removal basket, but we're actually letting science guide where capital goes. Um, and then a third way that we can sort of use capitalism is to influence climate policy. And this is a tough one because, um, you know, like it or not, businesses, investors, and other parts of the capitalist system have a lot of influence over policymaking. Now, I think a lot of us are supportive of getting money and big interests out of politics. But again, in the short time frame we have to act, how can we use those systems to get bold climate policy passed? 
businesses are often the engines of their communities. They employ people in, in given states. They represent a lot of revenue and growth for communities. When a big employer in a state talks, legislators listen. So how can we sort of wield this tool to help enact bold climate policy? Lots of different approaches can be taken here. Um, Project Drawdown, for example, placed a full page ad in the New York Times um, last year to vocalize the support of our business partners in passing the Build Back Better Act, which essentially turned into um, parts of the Inflation Reduction Act. Legislators after that told us that the business voice was crucial, both in closed door meetings, in public advocacy campaigns and more, in swaying key legislators to get this bill across the finish, finish line. So how can we motivate and incentivize and use the current system, getting businesses, investors, and influential actors in society to push climate policy faster? That's critical work that needs to be done within our existing system. Now, um, I work deeply with some of the world's biggest and uh, most climate leading companies out there, and I can tell you things are messy, right? Things are not happening necessarily at the scope and scale they need to. I know as well as just about anyone that this work is messy. It's very, very difficult to redirect the tools of capitalism. My team at Project Drawdown has tried, and what you see here on the screen is um, an investigative piece that was actually published shortly after Project Drawdown, very proudly published that New York Times ad. As you can see from this headline, you know, I had expressed disappointment that after months of dedicated work by me and my team, some of the businesses that we work closely with didn't step up to support climate action in the ways that we thought were most powerful. Many of them were doing it through other, were, were, were talking to legislators through other venues. Um, but I share this um, this this piece to, to say that we walk a fine line with it, playing the inside and the outside strategy, and this is messy work. So I think we need more effective tactics here. To use this incredible piece of art from the street artist Banksy, um, what are our tactics? How do we use our leverage to grow the right things and use our collective resistance to stop the bad things in the 2020s? So... My goal is for all of us to see ourselves as one team, whether we're working inside the system, trying to push it faster from the outside, whether we're a chief sustainability officer or an impact investor or a consumer or an activist or an eco-socialist, we are all part of this movement and solutions. But this is also not, this is not a story about how individuals don't matter to climate change. Blaming this crisis entirely on the politicians and fossil fuel companies is an easy out when the stakes are so high. So what kinds of leverage do we each have within the existing system? So first, there's strength in numbers. Um, we can really look at you know, how we build our people, how we find people who feel similarly in our places of influence. At work, you know, at, in your communities, find your people, there's strength in numbers. Second, um, and I want to just share quickly this, this quote um, from Naomi Klein, Movements are groups of people who come together around two things. One is a shared goal or purpose, and the other is a determination to make, make their ideas heard, even if existing power structures try to drown them out. So movements coming together with a very targeted goal um, are very powerful. Shareholder activism has proven to be um, a helpful leverage point in where you know investors and even employees as shareholders can ask their companies to move faster. Um, and I'm going to share quickly a, um, a graph here. So this is actually what we call a power map, um, the, because the idea of stepping up for effective change can be overwhelming. And to understand the power that we have, we have to take a close and thoughtful look at who we are in the world, what work we can do in our places of work or our businesses. Um, so thinking in terms of our collective power, this is um, a way that you can think about you know, how do, what are some of the, the goals that I have for my company? Do I want my company to, or wherever I work to support bold climate policy? Then who can I reach out to that has influence inside my business? Who might be a decision maker? Are they an ally of what I'm trying to do? How can I reach them? Um, and then we also have power around, you know, as consumers. So I know there's a lot of pushback against the idea of individual action, but we have power. We have the ability to make um, to make our voices heard and send market signals as participants in this system. And then lastly, I want to share um, this quote 
that I think is an amazing, um, amazing quote. When I was younger, I envisioned companies as being surrounded by impenetrable gray walls. I thought that I couldn't change corporations because they were inaccessible. And I thought they didn't want to change. But now youth understand that companies are made up of people. And that is the truth. One of the biggest learnings I have had in working within the existing system is that we are all trying our damnedest from wherever we sit to do everything that we can. And the more that we can see ourselves on the same side of this, the better off we will be. We are all trying different tactics. We are all doing what we can to move the boulders in front of us. But if we do that together and see ourselves on the same team, I think we will have a lot more, um, a lot more likelihood of doing what needs to be done. Um, and I'll end here by sharing um, what we call um, the drawdown aligned business framework. And I think this can be applied within a business, but anywhere. So this is really our attempt at saying, what are all the things, all the ways that we can influence, that businesses and, and large institutions can influence climate action? And then look at who, in, who within the system can help make those changes. So if you're looking at you know, leveraging capital toward climate solutions. You could, you know, if you work in finance, if you work in human resources, if you work in operations, if you work in supply chain, there is work for you to do. There are things to be done no matter where you sit within the system. And one of our goals within Project Drawdown and within Drawdown Labs is to help everyone see that they are part of this solution. So to come back to the question um, that was posed, that is this, you know, that, that makes up the, the, the content of this webinar, is capitalism compatible with climate change? I think the answer is, we'll see, but we have a role to play in making it so. So using our leverage to grow and accelerate the right things, using our collective resistance to stop the wrong things in the 2020s. This will require some of us to stay in the system to influence it from within and others to pressure it from the outside. The outside inside strategy focused on the same goals, using the tactics that available to each of us. And if you agree, then I think it's on each of us to find our find ways that we can help influence that system from the inside um, and from without. Um, and I'll end here from this quote um, from James Baldwin, the world is before you and you need not take it or leave it as it was when you came in. Um, so thank you so much for joining. I will end that right now and I will pass it back over to our amazing MC, um, Elizabeth and Todd. All right, Jamie, thank you for a wonderful presentation today. Wow, the questions are just flying in right now. So. We'll jump in and uh, start going through as many questions as possible here in the time that we have left today. Uh, first question I wanted to ask you was about that drawdown line business framework, which you showed at the very end. There was a question about why did your team create this framework and what was the need you saw in the world that was kind of the driving force behind the work that you're doing in this arena? Um, sorry, it was. did you say what was the driving force behind it? Yeah, what's the driving force behind that work you were doing around the business framework? Uh, um, yeah, so that was really, I mean, that was really precipitated by the um, the example I shared from, you know, sitting in the crowd in a in a at a sustainability conference was really okay. So if what we're saying is, you know, business can continue doing all the things that it's been doing, and then can you know add a new eco friendly business line or make gen you know kind of gradual reductions in their emissions over time we're not going to we're not at all addressing the root cause of this so the drawdown line business framework was really aimed at looking at how businesses beyond emissions in, in addition to emissions reductions can actually use their um, their influence their clout their resources to apply pressure in the system to scale climate solutions faster and kind of cut off the the, the stuff that is no longer compatible. One of the other questions that's kind of a theme that emerged in the Q&A here, um, I think, uh, um, let me see the name here, Greg does a nice job summarizing, is the question capitalism or economic growth? And we had a few questions along those same lines looking at, you know, is the question really here growth and consumption or is it capitalism or is it some 
you know, the two are obviously inextricably linked in many ways, so it's hard to separate the two. But what do you think about that question about, you know, capitalism or, or growth? The way that um, we sort of approached this session today was primarily focused on the aspect of capitalism that is the incessant focus on for profit, for profit generating activities. Um, there are many other questions around capitalism, and then this was hyper focused on what we, what, how, how, how we can operate within that system in the next in the next seven years to do in this very tight time frame we have to do some really very difficult work. Um, and so there are other aspects of capitalism, um, for example, the distribution of wealth and the exploitation of workers that is not, ex that is, you know, surrounds this, but isn't the direct focus of, of, of this talk. So this was really focused on how do we, you know, how do we use, what do we do within the capitalist system around specifically around emissions reductions and, and, and specifically focused on, on climate change in the next, the next decade. There are a few questions in the chat and the Q and A about um, sharing a recording of the presentation. So I'll just chime in really quickly to say that, yes, we will, will be sharing a recording of the presentation in a day or two. Um, if you registered today, which all of you obviously did, we'll be sending out an email with a recording of the presentation. Um, there are a couple of questions about the slides from the presentation. And I mentioned that we wouldn't be sharing the slides from today, but I'll ask one of my colleagues in the background here to please share a link to the Drawdown Roadmap. And if you visit the Drawdown Roadmap page towards the bottom, you'll see a link to download some of the key graphics that um, Jamie shared in today's presentation. So please check that out too as an opportunity and a place to find a few of the, the key slides from today. Um, the next question, Jamie, uh, is looking at uh, this question of what changes would you like to see in corporate management and leadership teams that will be tasked with leading this transition? So what additional you know, training or skill sets do you think that corporate leaders, corporate employees might need in order to really um, accelerate the transition you've been talking about today? I mean, I think number one is, you know, a hard look at, again, the concept of what needs what needs to grow and what doesn't. And I think that, it, to me, that is really a third rail concept um, to it's you know the 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 obvious thing to do if you're inside if you're you know if you're an executive inside a business is to look at playing around the edges because that means you don't have to address the core you don't have to look at your core business model you don't have to make hard choices about are certain products compatible or not are certain you know is it, are are we contributing to this by our very existence or can we actually pivot to be part of the solution genuinely and i think that conversation needs to be had within every business, you know, every, every bank, every investor looking at like, what, what is my core business model doing in the world? We don't have that conversation enough. Um, and there's lots of things that we can do around the margins, like, you know, tying executive compensation to the achievement of climate targets. There are things we can do about around educating directors on the board of companies. There are things we can do around policy advocacy, but if we're not having the conversation about, what is the core business model? And am I participating in this, you know, in, in this like continued extractive, um, you know, world that we have created and continue to participate in? There may be, you know, there's lots of opportunity for growth and climate solutions. There's lots of opportunities to pivot your entire business models. Big auto, you know, big auto companies have shown that it's it's not impossible to take, you know, to take a to take a, an enormous car company and transition to all electric vehicles um, that can be done. And I think th those are those are the questions that will really get at the heart of the matter. Um, and those are the questions and conversations that I think need to be had at the leadership level sooner than later. This is kind of a sticky subject, this next question, but a couple of people have asked us about the role of banking in all of this. Um, and I, just a preview for those of you tuning in today. Project Drawdown will actually be releasing a report, I believe, later in the summer on the banking industry and connections to climate and climate solutions. Um, so, what do you think? What do you what do you think the role of, the, of banking is in all of this in the banking sector? Great question. Um, I am not a banking expert, but I, um, at the highest level, um, 
clearly, you know, most the, clearly a lot of capital is going toward the wrong things right now. Um, and so, and as we, you know, as we work with some of our, our business partners to say, hey, talk to your banks, try to encourage your banks to get out of financing fossil fuels and get them in the business of, you know, ask your banks to, to, to fund climate solutions instead. It's, um, there are, you know, unless banks make that decision, which, um, you know, I don't fully understand the, the implications of, and I won't speak to it all, but I know that from the corporate side, if companies are trying to get their banks to get out of fossil, stop financing fossil fuels to align with their own sustainability goals, there aren't really a whole lot of big banks out there that they can move to. In fact, there's there's no big bank out there that can take a big company's money um, that is not invested in fossil fuels. So how do we use, you know, leverage, pressure, um, aggregated demands from companies or from, you know, from activist investors to say, you know, either, you know, do, do we create our own green bank in the, in the world? Do we, you know, how do, or how do we put pressure on these banks to use the leverage they have to stop financing, um, fossil fuels. And I think, you know, one, so one, one, um, avenue for that is the cash on hand that, that businesses have, which is often huge amounts of money. And then the, in other, another way is looking at the retire, you know, the savings, the retirement plans that, that businesses offer to their employees. Um, and there are a lot of great options there for, for businesses to move to plans that are, that are not, um, not invested in, in heavy emitting sectors. Great. Uh, another question that's come in in the chat and Q&A here today, someone is wondering, um, they're asking, as an early to mid-career professional looking to dive further into the climate and nature action space, what recommendations do you have to identify corporations that are willing and eager to make changes? What should we be looking out for to avoid greenwashing? Do you have any thoughts on that? That's such a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, it is very... It's challenging to parse through all of the noise, right? And try to understand what's legitimate, what's authentic, and what is greenwashing. Um, so I think, you know, number one, what is the business model of the company? Um, and if it's something that you could imagine, you know, just their their very business model, their reason for existence, if it's something that you could imagine pivoting into climate solutions, then that's, you know, that 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 checks that box for me. And then I would look at does the company have climate targets? That's like pretty much the um, the the floor rather than the ceiling. Um, and then are they, you know, are they active on if it's a larger corporation? Are they active on supporting climate policy at the state and federal level? To me, you know, it's really hard to understand how if a, how much a company is reducing their emissions and whether they're actually seeing the reductions that they're promising. But an easier way to tell, a better barometer for me has always been. Are they speaking out on? Are they doing the other things that we can measure? Are they speaking out on pu public policy? Pu public policy. Are they looking into you know green benefits for their employees? Are they reporting on their emissions transparently? Are they welcoming employee organizing? Are they welcoming other people getting involved and asking questions? Um, so I think there are other ways that you can tell, um, but it does take a little bit a little bit of studying. And again, that's sort of where our um, our drawdown line business framework, we developed that to also help the general public um, and, and potential, um, you know, potential em employees make a better, you know, ma make a more informed decision about um, the climate ambition of these companies. I'm going to pull together two questions here from David and Mark, because they're kind of related to one another. So the first question, I believe, comes from David. What are your thoughts on um, the concept of the donut economics model? And then follow-up question from someone else that kind of ties nicely into that. What are some tactics we can use to amplify and implement alternative economic models, i.e. circular degrowth, et cetera, within business as we transition away from late-stage capitalism? Great questions. Um, I'm a big fan of the, of the Donut Economics Framework. Um, they are part, the Donut Economics Action Lab is actually a, a partner of, of the Drawdown Labs program. Um, so we, they, they, the, the donut economic, the donut economics team has actually developed some resources for businesses to operate 
within the donut. Um, and so we have made the we have made a lot of their offerings and um, available to our business partners and really see them as a critical um, a critical step toward, you know, that we can take within the system without tearing down the system, um, but taking it to the next, you know, to, to, to toward that transition point. Um, and then I think, I mean, I think I, I'm not an expert on economic models at all, but I think part of the degrowth um, idea is that it's not no growth at all. I think it is saying that there, we need to see, there, there are certain areas that we need to see growth, things that, you know, human health, things that support um, health and well-being, um, climate solutions, I think. And but it's just calling out that there are areas where that need to shrink. And I yeah, um, I'm, I and I don't know, you know, any deeper than that to say if if what we're saying here is is similar. But I think um, I think it I think it's basically saying that there are areas we need to we need to just be upfront that that need to that need to transition. Um, and so I think we're ag agreed on the fact that there are um, there are areas that we need that we need to grow and some areas that need to shrink as well. Jacqueline is asking us to get a little more specific here. So <laughs> Jacqueline, we'll take you up on that uh, that question you put in the Q&A. So thanks for this question. Uh, Jacqueline's wondering, can you give an example of how you're working with or perhaps how Drawdown Labs is working with a private sector partner or entity to influence systemic longer term change while also leveraging capitalism in the next you know, few years going forward? Yeah. Great question. Um, so there are, so we can, you know, we kind of look at businesses superpower. So when when we when we look at our at project drawdowns broad climate solution sectors, electricity, transportation, food and agriculture. Um, and then you know, we set out to look at okay, what businesses, what businesses are really positioned to help scale these solutions in the world? Um, so we set out to intentionally kind of experiment with different types of businesses that could potentially be really set up to scale climate solutions in those sectors. Um, so we work with big energy use, you know, big tech companies who are big energy users who are using the system and the, the grid to, you know, to, to, to green, you know, they're using their power as a big energy user to green the electrical grid. And this, this example is specific to Google and this is public um, very public information, their 24 seven um, carbon free energy program, um, where they are using the exist, you know, their, their, the fact that they use a lot of energy for their, for all the people that are using Google every day. Um, and they've said that we're going to green the electrical grid everywhere we operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's not just helping Google meet their climate targets, that's providing a cleaner grid for everyone. Right. And so those are ways in which we really look at how we use the system um, to use that, you know, in, in, in that case, um, you know, the, the network of the, the grid and the, the network that Google operates in to really influence um, and incentivize uh, the, you know, a, a green electrical grid. And again, they do a lot of public policy work, working closely with states where they have data centers, et cetera. Um, and so that's one example in terms of a business model. And then we also, you know, occasionally do um, public policy work where there's a really in, in important um, climate bill as we did around the Build Back Better Act um, to really kind of start to leverage their, their, their influence in getting those bills across the line. Great, and just so folks know, um, we're pulling these questions from both the Q&A and the chat. Um, and there are quite a few in both sections, so we're doing our best to get through as many questions as possible today, um, organizing a few into, you know, one question for Jamie. Uh, but keep keep those questions coming, please, and we'll get to as many as we can in the next few minutes here. Um, a really important question came through in the Q&A um, from Raven. How do you see environmental and climate justice fitting into this puzzle? Yeah, that's a really, really important question, and one that we talked about um, as a team yesterday. Really looking at, you know, the the mission of Project Drawdown is to scale climate solutions quickly, safely, and equitably. We do look at a at at the, the you know a subset of climate solutions that explicitly have co benefits. So they also address you know not only carbon emissions, but 
health and well-being or um, you know helping alleviate poverty. And so we, you know, Project Drawdown as a whole does look at, you know, we, we look at them, we prioritize those solutions that also address, you know, the basic human rights and um, and and equity. Um, when it comes to looking at, you know, what we do around capitalism in the next in the next decade, I think part of the idea is that in order to build a more just an inclusive moral economic system, we need to be able to um, buy ourselves some time, right? So I think part of this is building in, building in, you know, um, into the the capitalist system ways that we can like stop the bleeding, so to speak, stop the bleeding of the greenhouse gas emissions that we are hemorrhaging into the atmosphere. Find ways to slow that so that we can work together to build the world that we all want. Um, and ideally part of the work that we do this decade will lay the groundwork for that. I'm a little bit a little bit cautious to get into politics, but we have a bunch of questions popping up related to politics. So I'll try and summarize the, the few of the questions here that are coming in in that space. A few people have been asking, um, Okay, it's one thing to kind of move the business sector on these issues, but it's another thing to move the political sector and, and the speed with which politicians move just doesn't need match the speed that we need to, you know, be reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So do you want to talk a little bit perhaps about the work you're doing to have with the private sector to nudge, you know, politicians to move more quickly and what else we might be doing in that space too? It's a great question. Um, yes, I mean, there's a lot of focus on public policy. I think, you know, we've made as an organization the strategic decision to focus on the actors, the big actors in society who are poised to not just set out a regulatory environment or make public policy that takes years to actually impact the atmosphere, but what are the actors in society who can who can work to scale climate solutions right now. And that's why we strategically within Drawdown Labs work with corporations, investors, philanthropists who have resources, financial resources, employee, you know, human resources, people power, um, and political influence and like scale to be able to move things faster with or without policy. I mean, we can, you know, there's a lot we can do. And I think we have proven especially you know in the during the Trump administration there's a lot we can do without having without having a big policy in place we now we see through the inflation reduction act how much faster things can move but we don't have to wait for that to happen um and so we do look at you know when i think of the capitalist system i think of what are the what are what are all of these leverage points and how do they interact and how how can we infiltrate that system and part of that is uh, who do legislators listen to? Well, they really listen when Google talks to them. They really listen when, you know, a big corporation that represents a lot of money, has a lot of sway, speaks. And so that's my, you know, that's my leverage point right there. That's what I'm going to push on to get that legislator to listen. And so I think we've tried to look at the full, the whole system, not just like our policymakers moving fast enough, but do we have access to other tools that can help sort of like move that that whole system faster as a whole, because we need, you know, we do need all of it marching forward together in, you know, toward the future we need. But we so we I think we can look at where there are, you know, influ, influence or leverage points between those actors, um, which is a lot, a lot again, a lot of um, what we have done in, in the last year around the the Inflation Reduction Act. Few people are asking, what can we as individuals do in this space? And then also, what are the most important actions that business need, businesses need to take right now? Um, so maybe you want to approach that, approach both of those angles. So what what is individuals should we be doing right now? What if you can wave a magic wand? What do you want to see companies doing differently right now? Um, I think on the individual level, I um, I mean it does. I I. I I think, um, and I think Elizabeth just put in the chat um, some tangible solution, you know, climate solutions that we can all uh, that individuals have influence over. 
Um, so making our homes more energy efficient and our appliances and using less energy in the first place, et cetera. Um, and then there is also, you know, looking at at what we, the things, you know, where 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 we operate in our lives as community members, or do we live in an apartment building and can influence our broader building or the 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 owner of the building? Are we, you know, what is our role in in the workplace? Most times, our, the the workplace, you know, the place where you work has more, or the place where you go to school has more of a climate impact than you do as an individual. So how can you influence them? How can you both support them in moving faster and bring your skills? And how can you like, you know, encourage and then, you know, sort of agitate a little bit to, to help them move faster. So I think, you know, the bringing our climate action to work is a really important um, leverage point in addition to doing the things that we can do at home. And look, we're all, you know, I think all of us probably on this webinar have some level of privilege. And to me, this is a moment of pulling out all the stops, doing everything that we can on behalf of those who don't have the means to take these actions and saying, you know, being a little bit more comfortable with risk. Like a lot of these things are risky. It's risky to try to get your company to do something. But if you, you know, feel the burning sense of urgency that I think a lot of us do, like we need to start, um, you know, so, some of us who are in positions of some level of privilege need to start being a little bit more comfortable with taking those risks to get things to move faster. We're just about out of time. So I'm gonna give you the last word of the webinar here, Jamie. So I'm gonna ask you a question. What's the, what's the one thing that you really hope someone who attended the webinar today walks away with? What's that, what's that one thought you wanna leave them with before we, before we wrap up here? I mean, stop, I think, stop playing around the edges. Like we just, we can't keep, we can't keep playing around the edges. We can't keep looking at like all the little accessory things we can do. We need to attack this at the core. And, you know, we, I think we have spent way too long trying to come up with ways that we can do this without actually getting to the root of the, the heart of the matter and making some really hard decisions. Um, and, so I think if each of us looks at the places we work, the things we, you know, the access that we have, the influence that we have, the leverage points that we have and say, I, you know, at its core, not just like, what am I, what can I do to make this a little less bad, but how can I actually use this to the fullest? And, you know, even if that means making some, some tough decisions, having those hard conversations at work, making those, you know, making people uncomfortable if, if that, if that's what it requires. Um, but looking at this and for the, you know, for uh, in terms of the urgency that it carries um, would be, I think, the most important thing that I hope um, could come out of this today. Very well said. A couple of quick announcements before I say a huge thank you to Jamie. I just want to mention that we do have a number of uh, donors and supporters of Project Drawdown on the webinar today. So huge shout out to all of you who are making this work possible. Um, we are a nonprofit, so if you'd like to support this work and really help us to accelerate climate solutions, um, we would welcome any donations, big or small, to keep this work going as quickly as possible. So thank you for your support. I want to also mention that uh, we'll be sending out a recording, as I mentioned, of the webinar, along with many of the links that we shared today, plus a summary of some of the main points of today's presentation. So look for that in your inbox in a day or two. And then last but not least, I um, hope you'll join us again on July 19th as, uh, as Matt Scott, Director of Storytelling and Engagement at Project Drawdown, joins us for a webinar titled Hidden Voices, Why Inclusive Storytelling is Critical to Climate Solutions. So please join me in thanking Jamie for a terrific webinar today, and we hope to be in touch with all of you soon. Take care and uh, keep up the good fight, everyone. We'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Bye now.